name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, last week we came to a very important turning point um, in, um, uh, in, in the life of the church, where, where Peter was prepared by you uh, to baptize the first Gentile convert, uh, Cornelius, and his household. And um, it took place, and we, 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 we saw that last week, and that's good news for us, because I think most of us probably trace our origins not to the Jewish people, but to the Gentiles. And um, the Lord, you said, go unto all the nations. And here we are. <laughs> so here comes everybody, Lord. <laughs> so we thank you for this great gift and help us now to um, begin to see how now St. Paul begins this great outreach. We move from the focus on Peter. We move uh, increasingly now to looking at Paul and, and his mission. So help us then, Lord, to uh, rejoice in all that you're doing in this beautiful Acts of the Apostles through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, now, um, just to uh, let's see, Let me just, again, remember what happened. Uh, Peter was uh, in uh, Joppa, which is south of Caesarea, on the coast, uh, and he had a dream. He went up on the roof. He had a vision, really, more than a dream, and uh, he saw this sheet take, uh, with all these clean and unclean animals, take Peter, slaughter, and eat. Nothing unclean has ever touched my mouth. Um, he says, nope, nope, not call unclean. What I've rendered clean, says the Lord. Okay. So Peter didn't understand what all that meant, but soon as no sooner had that happened, then there was a knock at the door and it was, uh, someone, uh, sending from Cornelius up, up the, the, to a town about 10, 15 miles North called Caesarea. Uh, and, uh, he wanted to meet with Peter and talk about, uh, uh, Christ. And so Peter went on his way. And uh, he um, entered that house, this, an unthinkable thing. He entered the house. Uh, he started talking about the Lord, and the Holy Spirit came down. And they started having some church up in there. <laughs> and he, when he saw the Holy Spirit moving in their lives, he had them all baptized. And then, of course, this is where we're going to pick up the story. We, we looked at it very briefly last week. Um, and we'll just read it again, just kind of as a quick summary. Um, the reaction was mixed with uh, among the Christians who were already the Jewish Christians. Now, I say the, the reaction was mixed with, I would say, tomatoes and eggs predominating, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> they, they weren't happy about what Peter had done, okay? Why did you go into the house of a Gentile, something no Jew should do? Why did you do this? And, you know, you're messing with our church, you know? And uh, all are welcome, but just don't sit in my pew. See, that kind of a thing. Okay. Now... Um, this, um, so this is where we're going to pick up the story. Let me begin. Uh, and then, as I say, we'll, we'll do a little bit of a transition, uh, into the ministry then of, um, um, uh, of, of Paul, uh, later on. And if we get into pretty well in chapter 12, all right now, so it goes here. I'm, I'm now in Acts chapter 11 and verse one. All right. I'll do a little bit of reading and then I'll ask one of you to help me. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him saying, you went to an uncircumcised man, you ate with them. But Peter then explained the whole thing. Uh, I was in the city of Joppa praying and then I was in a trance. I saw a vision and something like a great sheet came down from heaven uh, by its four corners, and looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. Now this happened three times, and then it was all drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house which, uh, in which we were and sent to me from Caesarea. Uh, the, the spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers accompanied me and we entered the man's house. And he told us that he had been, he had seen an angel saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who was called Peter. And he will declare a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, Peter said, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as it had on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and uh, uh, Holy Spirit. And then if God then gave them the same gift he had given to us, uh, who was I then that I should stand in God's way? 
Now, when they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, Then uh, to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Okay. So there's a lot of layers there. Uh, we see, first of all, as I say, uh, the racism of that time, how hostile Jews and Gentiles were to one another. Um, it was a shared contempt, but uh, clearly these Jewish Christians are, uh, we might say in our modern word, they're discriminating against uh, non-Jewish people. Uh, they don't really want these uh, stinking Gentiles to come into the church with all their dumb food and all of their own, you know, the way they dress, the way they act, and so on. Uh, let's keep the church nice and pure, and let's just keep it the way we like it. And, you know, we, you know, so even though the Lord had said, go therefore unto all the nations, let's just say here we are into the 10th chapter, and it still ain't happened. And uh, so uh, the Lord had to kind of kick or push, uh, and he prepared Peter. And uh, Peter, did, uh, Peter did exactly what he was told to do. And uh, so the, the Gentiles are now brought in. Now, with that in mind, uh, I, I think that what, what I want to say is, uh, again, these are, I think, um, when we look at the, what, what does the Bible teach about questions of race, uh, racism or ethnic uh, hatreds or, or things? Well, very clearly that it's just unacceptable to God, see, that we're all called to the be, you know, the one family of God and we're not to kill or hate our enemy, we're to love them and, and make them our brothers and sisters. And um, so this is uh, God's plan. And it took a little while, but it's been done. Now, what you'll notice another layer to the story is the authority of Peter and how Peter is guided by God. And I told you this last time, but let's repeat it, uh, that you remember when, when Peter, we were, they were up at Caesarea Philippi and, and Jesus asked the apostles a question, who do people say that the son of man is? And they, they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're a prophet, some, you know, but who do you say that I am? And there was silence. And then finally, Peter spoke, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And God said to him, now, Peter, you got the right answer, but I want you to know it's not because you're the smartest guy here. It's because my father revealed this to you. See, that's how you have spoken this, this fundamental dogma of the church. You, you, Peter, have announced this fundamental dogma of the church. Now, what's the other fundamental dogma, of course, not just that Jesus is Lord, but also that he rose from the dead. You'll notice that even there in the Acts of the Apostles earlier, they, they, the church makes the formal declaration that Christ is risen only when he has appeared to Peter. So there was a cry that went up uh, in, the, uh, in Luke's gospel where it says, the Lord is truly risen. He has appeared to Peter. Up until this time, there were, the women had seen him, two, two disciples on the road to Emmaus all reported this, but they're like, hmm. But when he appears to Peter, now we move from a simple, some people have heard and seen to, this is, an, a dec, this is now a declaration. The Lord is truly risen. He has appeared to Peter. So I want you to see once again, even in his infancy though, but it's still here, the office of Peter, the office of Simon Peter, to unite the church and to, uh, to make, you know, if you will, um, these dogmatic um, and also binding uh, moves upon the church. And we'll see that once again in Acts 15, where Peter again takes the role and unites a divided group of apostles. And we'll see that, as I say, in Acts 15. So you see here that Peter had been prepared by God, sent by God, and, and he does what he's told to do. And then when he's withstood by members of the church who want an explanation, it's not wrong to ask the Pope questions. I think in our own time, we had a lot of questions. We're doing a lot of head scratching sometimes when the Pope speaks, because he often says some kind of odd stuff. And we're like, what, 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 you know, uh. Uh, and that's okay. But again, it, we, we, we do so, I, I would pray with respect, but also, um, you know, uh, not everything that comes out of a Pope's mouth is meant to be dogmatic. So we have to make some distinctions and we can engage the Pope on, on, on matters. But you notice again, these are very solemn declarations, right? The Gentiles are now co-heirs with the Jews. See, that's a solemn declaration. Christ is truly risen. That's a solemn declaration. Uh, we also see again that, um, uh, you know, Peter, uh, uh, the exercise of filling the office of, of uh, Judas, who had committed a suicide. And now, um, and on and on I could go. But you, you see the idea that Peter has a very mm, formative role, but it's not just because he's the natural leader or the smartest guy, but God has given him a kind of an anointing. And you see, so in trusting Simon Peter to teach these dogmas um, and to sort of unite the church, 
in the fundamental proclamation of the faith is not just, we're not just trusting in man, we're trusting in God. We're saying somehow, Lord, you've anointed our Pope to sort of keep us from going too far or going too far away from something. So we see also that even here recently, uh, there was a, a lot of pressure put on the Pope to uh, dramatically widen the permission for married priests and then consider a fem female diaconate. And again, I, I, I said, I just don't think it's going to happen. I think the Holy Spirit is not, not going to let him do it. And people kind of said, well, you're being kind of naive, aren't you? Don't you, think, you know? But in the end, he didn't do it. You know, <laughs> At the moment where everyone was expecting this would be said, at least to one degree or another, he didn't. He stopped short. And so even here, uh, as, as unpredictable as Pope Francis can sometimes be, and sometimes says some strange things that don't seem to make a lot of sense, or just even sometimes just plain old unkind, this doesn't mean that we can never have disagreements with him, but when it comes to fundamental doctrines and and so we do have to trust that somehow, you know, God's got his back and he's got our back, okay? And this is a, one of the articles, or as you, you see, a, a kind of a faith that we have not in man, but in God, all right? Now, again, it's been sorely tested, but we've had, uh, uh, we've had situations in the past where um, we had to simply trust that, that uh, you know, the popes wouldn't go too far, and, and, and they have not. Okay. Any comments or questions about this section? Uh, we're going to we're going to move on here in a moment, but uh, you know there may be some questions that you have about what took place, whether in the reading or about the papacy or anything like that. Okay. Well, if you do, if a question does arise, we can talk about it later. Okay. Now, would somebody like to be my reader tonight as we now turn our attention to the Church at Antioch? Okay, so um, let's see. Um, hey, Ben, do you think? Well, actually, your your uh, microphone, Ben's a little bit grainy, so I'm not. Um, yeah, yeah. Stephanie, you've done a lot of good reading for us. You want to do it? Sure. Okay, so we'd be at uh, Acts uh, eleven and verse nineteen. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that arose because of Stephen, went as far as Phoenicia, Phoenicia. Cyprus, yeah. Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but Jews. There were some Cypriots and Syrians <laughs> among them, however, who came to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks as well, proclaiming the Lord Jesus. The land of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they went to Barnabas to go to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced and encouraged them all to remain faithful to the Lord in firmness of heart, for he was a good man, filled with the Holy Spirit and faith. And a large number of people was added to the Lord. Then he went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a large number of people. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. Okay. It's a good place to stop. <clears throat> now, um, gosh, I... I I should get better at this technology, maybe to put a map up for you. But if you can imagine the Holy Land today, as you know, it's at the um, it's at the uh, eastern end of the Mediterranean. And if you if you were to be in Jerusalem, you would head up north into Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, where and, and the area where Jesus lived. And you were to go even further north, you'd go into modern day Lebanon. It was called Phoenicia at that at this time. Uh, so uh, the Lebanese are kind of the descendants of the Phoenicians. Okay, now. Um, even further north than that, way up near where the, uh, where the um, Mediterranean bends to the left and, you know, the, the, the very north, the very northeastern corner of the Mediterranean, you would find Antioch. That's where Antioch is. And a little bit around the bend to the left is where Tarsus is, okay? So if you kind of imagine, so the church is moving north here, um, and we see that um, the, 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 um, this is, again, because of the persecution 
that had arisen regarding Stephen. So remember, we talked about that earlier. Sometimes God allows the church to get a little roughed up uh, and to be persecuted to get us, uh, pur help us to be more purified and, so and also to get us uh, to sometimes to other places where he needs us to be. And so we see that now how the church continues to spread. Now, um, it says here that uh, some of the men, um, if I'm in verse 20 now, some of them, uh, the men of Cyprus and Cyrene coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus, okay? And uh, a great number of them uh, came and they believed to, in the Lord. So now you start to see how this, the, this mission to the Gentiles, the Hellenists would be, I'm sorry, these aren't the Gentiles yet. The Hellenists are the Greek-speaking Jews, okay? Um, the, um, um, this footnote says something. They're, they're saying um, interesting here. Well, maybe, maybe the word Hellenist is being used a little bit different here. But anyway, so let's go ahead and presume they are Gentiles, preaching to the, preaching the Lord Jesus. And 20, verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was upon them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Now, this report then came, again, we see, we've had this read to us, but to the church in Jerusalem, who sent Barnabas up there. Now, remember, the mission to the Gentiles is very new. So uh, the church wants to make sure, let's to make sure we're doing this right. <laughs> you know, we want to, so they, they, they send a kind of a delegation from Jerusalem, which is kind of the Roman, uh, what Rome is today, Jerusalem was at that moment. That's where Peter and the other apostles were. And this new mission to the Gentiles has now begun. But of course, and, and there's some preaching that's going on up at Antioch, and this is all heard as good news, but let's just send somebody up there to kind of scope it out and look at it. Now, again, this is an important thing from a Catholic perspective. You know, um, we, um, we are a church that's hierarchical, that, 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 that teaching authority and the authority to teach is something that's carefully guarded. Um, we, um, uh, we want to, you know, make sure that there are those who are teaching the faith, both have a mandate, but also are teaching proper doctrine. Now, at, other, at certain times, we've been better about this than other times. Mm -hmm. and right now, I'm going to tell you, sometimes there's a little bit of laziness going on. There's a lot of people, that are, there's a, maybe some too much dissent that's occasionally allowed. However, I want to say that even in my own lifetime, we had a moment where back in the 80s, whew, it was like the Wild West in Catholicism. You could almost say anything you wanted and say it was all in the spirit of Vatican II. So two things had to happen from the church. Uh, the publication of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, was, which was strongly resisted by dissenters, because they knew once that thing came out, you could have a go-to source and say, you know, that ain't right. Uh, and uh, so once the, that was the first step. The second step was there was a visitation of all the seminaries. There was a lot of bad stuff being taught in seminary when I was back in seminary. I don't even want to tell you some of the stuff they taught me in seminary when I was there, all right? I want to just say they ain't never met my Jesus, uh, as some of those teachers. So um, so there was an investigation of the seminaries and a rooting out of, of dissent. And for a while there, I think things really got cleaned up uh, in the seminaries in terms of uh, bad teaching. And um, the catechism also helped to clarify that, yes, we're in a new setting after the Second Vatican Council, but here's what the faith says in this setting, and here's what you can teach, and here's what's not in conformity. And so those two things helped us back in the, uh, in the late 80s and uh, early 90s to bring the church back into some conformity. And there's an old saying in Latin, uh, ecclesia semper reformanda, right? The church is always in need of reform. And so I think at a time now where there's a lot of doctrinal uncertainty again and so on, we're going to we're going to see that the church is going to have to kind of snap to here and, and set some limits. Uh, that the German bishops are like way out of control right now. Uh, well, the teachers be, had to become the students at that time. They had to almost relearn yeah. back then. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Especially because, uh, you know, you, you grew up in the older church and a lot of things suddenly changed. And yeah, a lot of stuff became very uncertain. So what I want to just emphasize here is that this, notice again that this, this instinct is already present in the early church. A lot of people think like, oh, the early church, it was just so nice. People could just love Jesus. And they walked around talking about him and everybody loved each other. And everybody thought Jesus is just all right with me. And it's very myopic. It's not true. Paul had battles with all kinds of heresies and things that he had to keep fighting 
against and and the early church uh, you know had a lot of its own struggles and troubles and and so you see here barnabas is being sent both to encourage them but also to kind of check out well, weren't, the, weren't the gentiles dangerous didn't they think of the gentiles being dangerous did they have to well they thought of the gentiles as being dangerous i guess but i mean at the end of the day it's more i would say it's probably more of a form of racism really than, than an authentic fear the gentile people were no more violent or anything than than, than anyone in the jewish community um now then the roman empire the, the roman soldiers were to be feared but the gentiles would just mean somebody who's not jewish it's a pretty big group of people and uh so if they did have fears they were probably rooted in you know kind of the kind of distrust that comes from what we come today to call racism or ethnic hostility okay all right now uh so barnabas is sent for this purpose so here we are uh verse 24 for barnabas was a good man full of the holy spirit and of the faith Okay? He's not just a good guy, but he, has, he knows the faith. Okay? And a great many of people were added to the Lord. Barnabas went up then to Tarsus also to look for Saul. Okay? And when he found, remember he had befriended Saul um, uh, when, when the community was afraid of, 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 of Saul, uh, a.k.a. Paul. And um, uh, Barnabas kind of helped to make, give him introductions and into the community and so on. So, uh, so he went and he found he went and found Saul. Tarsus is probably around, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 miles off to the west of uh, Antioch. So he made a day or two journey there and he came back with him to, brought him back to Antioch. And it says for a whole year, they basically served as catechists. Okay. Barnabas and Saul uh, serving as catechists there in that church. Okay. Um, and there's this little beautiful thing here that for the first time, the disciples were called Christians. Now, why is that important? Well, most people just thought of uh, this Jesus thing as a, as a sort of an offshoot of Judaism. Uh, in fact, some, you know, many Jews just considered it a heretical form of Judaism. Um, even the Romans uh, thought, well, they're, they're just a, a kind of a, a, another branch of the Jews. Uh, these Jews fight among all kinds of things among themselves, and there's this little group called Christians. I think, for example, the Emperor Claudius, you know, kind of just described them this way. These are just... Uh, kind of an offshoot of, uh, um, of Jews. You know, these Jews have all their disputes and they're just another group within Judaism. And so th this is significant that the, this name Christian now arrives. They're beginning to distinguish themselves. For the most part, they've been excluded from the synagogues. They're not under any illusions that they're going to be really welcomed back. They're beginning now to self-identify and become more of a contiguous group uh, that stays increasingly away from the synagogues and is now going to become much more diverse as a community, culturally speaking, as well. So for all these reasons, uh, this name, Christian, uh, is a, uh, is, is, it shows you a very, um, something's going on inside the church in terms of how they understand themselves, okay? All right, now we're going to finish out the chapter here. Um, uh, if you'd, um, uh, is Ava, could, where did I, I lost your picture. Oh, I'm sorry, Stephanie. Uh, mm -hmm. If you um, uh, want to just finish out this ch chapter, 20, starting with verse 27. At that time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine all over the world, and it happened under Claudius. So the disciples determined that according to ability, each should send relief to the brothers who lived in Judea. This they did, sending it to presbyters in care of Bar Bar Barnabas and Saul. Okay. Now this uh, taking up of collections would be a fairly routine thing that Paul would also do. Uh, the church in Judea, down in Jerusalem, was exceptionally poor uh, because they were so strongly persecuted by the Jews there in Jerusalem. Uh, it was a very, you might think of Jerusalem kind of like a university town or, or something like that, where, you know, um, they were very hawkish about doctrines and things, and they didn't brook these new ideas about the Christians, and they were very severely persecuted. So probably the poorest Christians there were anywhere would be found in Judea. Hmm? Uh, by the way, that's still largely true today. The Christian communities in Jerusalem used to be as much as 30% of what we call today the Holy Land or the Land of Israel. Now they're down to about 2%. 
and they're, they're the poorest of the poor in a way because they're, they're equally hated by Muslims and Jews together. <laughs> so they, have, they, have, they, have, they have a double enemy. Um, and um, they're very, very poor. So every year we take up a collection for the Holy Land, the churches in the Holy Land, and we give it to the Franciscans who minister there. Every Good Friday, we take up a Holy Land collection, it's called, for the Christians there. And they're in great poverty. But we also see that there was a famine predicted. Now, notice who does this prediction. It's this group uh, called prophets, and among them Agabus. Now, this ministry or this office of prophet, is seem, it seems to be up and running and operative in, in this early stage of the church. Um, the, um, uh, Paul mentions it a little bit in his letters to Timothy and Titus, but uh, it, it's mainly mentioned in Acts, and you don't find much more of a reference after that, that there was a, a, a kind of a group of people that were known as prophets. So what happened to them? Why, you know, for example, by the time you really get to Titus and Timothy, those letters, Paul doesn't mention it as an official office. Um, he mentions it as more of a charismatic gift, but among these um, offices, you know, were the bishop, the priest, and the deacon. Um, but so it seems most scholars seem to think that this office of prophet got folded up into the office of bishop who became the teacher. Remember, prophet doesn't just mean predicting the future, although contextually is sort of used that way here. But a prophet is fundamentally someone who speaks for God. A prophet says, thus saith the Lord. See? And so it's not just a, a prophet isn't just a teacher. Um, a prophet is a, uh, you know, uh, a prophet is um, uh, someone who speaks for God, literally from the Hebrew and uh, prophemi, um, which means to speak on behalf of or for God. Okay. So uh, what, what exactly happened to this office or this, this charismatic group that were known as these prophets who wandered about uh, making prophecies uh, is, is not exactly known, but it seems that it got folded into the office of bishop, okay? And so that's about the best I can do with that. Uh, but you notice again, they did make an accurate prediction about a coming famine that happened in the time of Emperor Claudius and um, they, they were prepared. Uh, a little bit like Joseph in the Old Testament, right? Okay, now, comments or questions, rebuttals, wonderments? I'm just such a good teacher that I leave you with no questions. It just amazes me. <laughs> well, you talk about disciples, the difference between the disciples and the apostles. There yeah. are only 12 of those. Yeah, interesting, you yeah. say Paul took the plate, took Judas' Judas's mm -hmm. place? Matthias did. So let's talk a little bit about the terms uh, apostle and, and disciple. A disciple is, is, uh, is a, a, literally comes from the Latin root disco discare, which doesn't mean to dance, it means to learn. So uh, this is where we get the word like, I'm, I'm learning a discipline of, uh, you know, we, we, all, we, we can sometimes think of a body of learning as a discipline. So a discipline is, is to, to, to is a disciple, where we get the word disciple, is rooted in that word for disciplina, namely one who's learning, who's a learner or a follower of a teacher. So rabbis had students, or we, they would actually call them disciples. Okay, so it simply means a follower or a learner. Okay, someone who's under the teaching authority of someone else. Okay. Now, among the disciples, Jesus had many disciples, but from among the, the disciples, he chose 12 men whom he named apostle. Now, apostle in Greek means one who is sent. So they, and when they say they're just sent, it doesn't mean just go over here. It means go in my name and represent me and teach, you know, what I've told you, you know. So in other words, they're not just, you know, going somewhere. They're, they're, they're actually representing. It's a little bit like where we get the word ambassador, okay? Now, you mentioned that there were 12. Originally, there were 12. And then when Judas died, uh, Peter did say we need to fill his office. So he saw the word of the apostle as an office to be filled. We saw that in Acts chapter 1. And they filled the office. Now, um, it would appear, though, that two others received the title apostle. The only ones we know for sure would be Barnabas and Paul. Now, why? I uh, don't know exactly with Barnabas, but the criteria for being an apostle would be someone who had walked with Christ while he was on this earth and been in that band of disciples who saw Jesus and heard him preach and teach and work miracles. So that's the first criteria. The second criteria 
uh, that they were male. <laughs> the third criteria would be that um, um, the, who walk with us uh, and, and witnessed, witnessed Jesus was risen from the dead. Okay, now Barnabas apparently met those criteria. We don't know exactly how, uh, but, uh, but Paul, he says, I was born out of a, the natural order. Paul did see Jesus risen from the dead, but not like the others did. He saw him st standing at the right hand of God in heaven, you see. He saw him standing there, uh, risen from the dead, and he heard Jesus say, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Um, so he did see Jesus risen from the dead. And as far as having receiving Jesus' teaching, Paul says that it was infused into him. Nobody taught him, but the Lord himself just infused the knowledge of Jesus' teachings uh, in, in him. So this would be um, uh, how he qualifies to be an apostle. But Stephanie, about after this time, really, uh, this title doesn't go to anyone else. Um, so that's interesting. So what's the parallel? We would have fast forward to today's time. Yeah, bishops. Uh, the, the, the office of bishop really takes up the office of apostle. However, there's, a, there's an important difference in, in, in a bishop and an apostle only in this sense. They fill the office of apostle, but instead of being the apostles were sent, you know, you see the idea? They're sent out. Whereas a, a bishop, it, literally the Greek word epico, episkopos or episkopoi, the in the plural, means an overseer. So they are meant to stay in a location and oversee a church, but they fulfill the office of an apostle, okay? Uh, but they, instead of being itinerant uh, apostles sent out to go represent Christ, they stay put in an area and they oversee a church. So, okay, does that make sense? So yes, uh, we do believe the office of, you know, of apostle, of course, the bishops are the successors of the apostles. Mm -hmm. But the title apostle seems to just cease after Paul and Barnabas. It's no, at no point is it attributed to anybody after them, okay? Um, now, uh, that would be, uh, I hope that wasn't too long of an answer, but she's asking, how is a disciple different from an apostle, right? So all the apostles are disciples, but not all disciples are apostles. <laughs> all right, if that makes sense. And uh, so all of us are disciples. Yeah, Some because you say bishops are priests. Yes, yeah, right. Priests, right. Not all priests are bishops. Right, exactly. They might be it. Okay, so uh, any other questions? Now we're going to see here, um, uh, uh, some some kind of wrapping up of this first section of the Acts of the Apostles in the next chapter here, um, as we get into chapter twelve, and and um, and then we're going to really begin in chapter thirteen to see the the the, um, uh, the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas and. Uh, we really then move into what we would call the Acts of Paul. So we're kind of wrapping up the Acts of Peter here. Uh, not that Peter won't be featured at all in the coming chapters, but the focus now will shift to Paul. All right. Now, with that in mind, by the way, let's just say this. Today is the Feast of St. Peter and Paul. Uh, happy Feast Day, everybody. It's a solemnity today. Amen. And uh, okay, good. Now, so let's go ahead and get into chapter 12 and see if we can, you know, even get through it. It, it has a lot of just like I would say, um, uh, it's, 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 you know, quick information given to us about different situations going on in the church. Uh, and we'll see how, we'll see how it unfolds. Okay, so you want to just go ahead and continue, Stephanie, and read, read the first uh, five verses here of chapter 12. Sure. About that time, King Herod laid hands upon some members of the church to harm them. He had James, the brother of John, killed by the sword and when he saw that he was pleasing to the Jews he proceeded to arrest Peter also it was the feast of unleavened bread he had him taken into custody and put in prison under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each he intended to bring him before the people after Passover Peter thus was being kept in prison but prayer by the church was fervently being made to God on his behalf. Okay, now, <laughs> we're going to have a very charming little story set up here in a minute, but look, y'all, did you notice something? James is beheaded. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's James of Peter, James, and John fame, you know? <laughs> in other words, these are, this, is, this, is, this is one of the three most central disciples that the Lord singled out, Peter, James, and John. How often do you hear that expression in the Gospels? This is 
um, this is, and, and what does Luke do? He says, it's one line he devotes to it. One line. You know? I mean, it's astonishing. I mean, he, sometimes Luke can be infuriating that way. You know, he just doesn't give you, well, wait a minute. This is like one of the top three. Tell us some more. Did, did the church have a funeral? What happened? Where's he, you know, all the kind of stuff that we might want to know more about. Um, he's just, now nah, Herod had him arrested and then beheaded. This, he saw that this pleased the Jews. So he went after Peter and got him arrested uh, after he beheaded James. And um, Peter's now getting ready probably to be beheaded. You know, he's going to be killed. You know, not, it won't happen, but but that's the, that's the idea. So, but isn't that interesting, you know, that, Peter, James, and John, Peter, James, and John, Peter, James, and John. And all of a sudden, just whoop, he's off the picture. Um, and so that's an amazing um, sort of um, paucity of words, shall we say, about, about this rather dramatic killing. of uh, the, first, the first apostle to lose his life uh, is James. And uh, okay. Remember, um, there came a moment when the mother of James and John kind of wanted to make sure Jesus had them... Uh, uh, well appointed uh, for um, <laughs> uh, offices when he should come into his own. Uh, make sure these sons of mine sit one at your right, the other at your left. And, and Jesus said, Do you, can you drink from the cup I'm about to drink from? You know, we can, they said. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 uh, and eventually, uh, you know, he said, but he said, okay, then you will drink from it. But I, but I, I can't even, I can't promise you seats at my right and my left. That's for those for whom it's been reserved. I'm sure his mother's at his right. <laughs> At any rate, but okay. <clears throat> but all that said, um, the um, uh, what we, we, we want to say here is that you see now, though, James did drink the cup that Jesus drank from now. He's, he's now given his life. He's the, the first martyrdom of, 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 a, of one of the apostles. And uh, all of them, except John, although we don't know for sure, but it, it would seem that all of them except John would go on to die martyrs' deaths. Okay, it was tough work being an apostle. Huh? All right. Now, um, we, um, we see now that Peter's in jail. Now, here we have a, what I would say is a, um, a rather a remarkable, and, and there's kind of, a, it's almost a charming story. So let's go ahead and read how he gets rescued from prison. So starting again now with verse, uh, what is that, six? Mm -hmm. yeah. On the very night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter, secured by double chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while outside the door, guards kept watch on the prison. By the way, can I just interrupt Stephanie to say, look at the, the overkill here. Look at this. I mean, all even before we, he was kept guarding. in prison, yeah, all these guards, how I many, four squads of soldiers to guard him. Mm -hmm. What? You know, but remember, he's had the reputation of slipping out of jail before, see? And, uh, but this overkill, and now he's sleeping, literally chained to uh, two sentries, uh, bound with chains. Um, I mean, sleeping between two soldiers, overkill, real overkill. Now, what I want to do is spiritualize this for you for a minute. Look, has it ever wondered, have you ever wondered why is it that people are so upset with the Catholic Church and what we think and what we don't think? You know, what's that all about? I mean, I'm just... I'm just some dude. We're all just people, you know, a Catholic church, a Catholic. And why? Well, I'm going to tell you why. I mean, I think Satan has a special hatred for the Catholic church because it's the church that Christ founded. And we've been here 2,000 years. And um, yes, I know some of our teachings are controversial, but they've always been controversial. But people don't care what other groups think. There's a special hatred and a real overkill when it comes to the Catholic Church in a lot of people's mind, we we occupy far too much space in their mind as and you know. But you know, do they accept Catholicism as being mm -hmm. that first? Well, I, I I think I think they're giving undue. I mean, um, they're giving honor to the Church unawares because they don't fume about the Methodist or the Baptist or the or even even the Muslims, right? This, this special anger and hatred reserved for the Catholic Church in Western culture is a remarkable, it's a remarkable overkill. And you think that we had all the power in the world. We don't, you know? Um, but you see that. And so I, I, I say they're actually giving us unawares, they're giving homage to the fact that there's something special about the Catholic Church, that, that we're, we, we're public enemy number one for a reason, you know? Um, because somehow they know deep down inside it, but not just they. Remember, 
This hatred is inspired by Satan. And Satan knows the power of the sacraments. Satan knows the power of the truth and that the church has guarded this truth for 2,000 years. And so Satan inspires a very unique and over-the-top hatred for a collection of human beings that really, frankly, were not that powerful. I mean, can we just suddenly pull an army together and conquer this country? God, if we, there were 75 million of us and we actually agreed on anything, we, we might be powerful, but we don't. We're divided among ourselves. Gosh darn, you know, 75 million Catholics that agree on any one thing, the, the politicians have to be pretty... Uh, but you know, know, I was just telling my cousin this morning that the one thing about being Catholic, you can go anywhere in the world. I took a trip yeah. to Las Vegas by myself. Right. And I could walk into the church. Right there. No problem. Christmas Day, walk into the church and... We're everywhere. Read it and everything, same right. rituals and all. Yeah. Anyway, but you see this overkill with Peter, right? And we see a lot of this, I think, in, in the special hatred reserved for the Catholic Church, particularly in times like ours, but down through the history as well. And likewise, prior to that, the Jewish people, there's a special hatred reserved for them in, in cultures. And again, uh, they are the chosen people of God. And um, somehow, Satan inspires special hatred for the Jews, as well as for uh, you know, for the Catholic, Christians in general, but especially Catholics. And I think this is because he knows exactly where the spiritual power really resides. See, what's the value of one mass see, to change history? And so, again, uh, this is, I think, uh, so it's not just a, a strange sociological fluke or that we're somehow politically all that connected and we can do all these things. None of that. We're not that powerful in any sociological or political sense. So why all this hatred, see, again? Well, what I meant to say is because we have numbers. The numbers. Well, we do, but if we're not united enough to really, really present, I think, a major threat. But we are big. We're big. Yes, we are. Okay, well, anyway, I'll leave that with you. But it's, what's part of, it's part of what we call the mystery of iniquity, huh? There's a kind of a mystery of iniquity that's at work here. And um, all right, well, go on. Uh, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Stephanie, but why don't you just pick up again at the uh, verse 6 again. At verse six, yeah, on on the very night you mean just started over? Yeah, well, Peter's rescued me. Yeah, on twelve, chapter twelve, verse six. Okay, on the very night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter, secured by double chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while outside the door guards kept watch on the prison. Suddenly, the angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and awakened him, saying, get up quickly. The chains fell from his wrists. The angel said to him, put on your belt and your sandals. He did so. Then he said to him, put on your cloak and follow me. Mm -hmm. So he followed him out, not realizing that what was happening through the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first guard, then the second and came to the iron gate leading out to the city, which opened for them by itself. They emerged and made their way down an alley, and suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter recovered his senses and said, Now I know for certain that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod, and from all that the Jewish people had been expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who is called Mark, where there were many people gathered in prayer. When he knocked on the gateway door, a maid named Rhoda came to answer it. She was overjoyed, so overjoyed when she recognized Peter's voice that instead of opening the gate, she ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. They told her, you are out of your mind. But she <laughs> insisted that it was so. But they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter came continued to knock, and when they opened it, they saw him and were astounded. He motioned to them with his hand to be quiet and explained to them how the Lord had led him to of the prison and said, report this to James and the brothers. Then he left and went to another place. At daybreak, there was no small commotion among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. Herod after instituting a search, but not finding him, ordered the guards, tried and executed, 
Then he left Judea and spent and spent some time in Caesarea. Okay, good place to stop there. Now, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, Rhoda, the maid, you know, sees Peter at the door. Instead of letting him in, <laughs> she runs back into the house. And, um, you know, they can't believe it's really Peter. And they say, well, it's his angel, you know. And so isn't that interesting? You know, it's just another little attestation that we have guardian angels, you know, that the Bible teaches us uh, that each of us has an angel assigned to us. Um, so let's take a look, a little bit of a look at, at this, um, this story. Um, we, we, we see that it's kind of a, we could maybe see it as a, I don't know, um, um, sure what I'm looking for, um, a paradigm for our life um, and what needs to sometimes take place in our life, right? So with that in mind, um, it says that, again, here is, here Peter is, you know, bound between these soldiers. He is um, uh, in, in fetters or in chains, okay? Now here too, this is something of a picture of our life. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry, I just lost all your beautiful faces. There you are, okay. Now, um, this is, um, um, this may sound a little extreme. Not everybody's in this kind of bondage, or are they? You know, in other words, St. Paul says before our baptism that we were dead in our sins. That's, that's pretty bound and chained, if you ask me. Um, we, uh, we have to sometimes understand just how serious our bondage is. Um, we are, um, you know, if we're, not, if we're not being set free by Christ, that we're in terrible bondage to this world, bondage to our passions, bondage to the devil, and, and bondage to, uh, to all the vicissitudes and, and, and things of this world. Um, our goal is to get free, free. And uh, now, all during this moment, you'll notice again, the church is praying. See? So Peter, if you will, let's just let Peter represent us. So when you were born, and I was born, we were born with original sin. We were dead in our sins, as scripture says, and St. Paul writes. And likewise, we, uh, we uh, but the church is praying, always praying. Now, ideally, most of you had your parents bring you right to the church, and we, you know, we, you, we, we, you were baptized. But, but notice again that behind the scenes, the church is praying. Behind the scenes, the church is praying. And because of this, Paul, is, I mean, Peter is going to be set free. This, this will reach this man who is in bondage, right? Who we're just allowing now to represent an average Christian. Uh, we already know Peter's already been, you know, baptized and all that. But the point is, just let the image be there. This is our condition. We're, there's four squads outside the door. <laughs> there's, there's, um, there's, uh, there, he's chained with double chains and between sleeping between two soldiers. Like, wow. Now, in the old rite of baptism, we, were, we had more of these things, but there's, in every baptism, before we do a baptism, there is a prayer of exorcism set, see? Um, there is this, uh, now the old rite has some pretty powerful exorcisms, you know? Exorcisote immundissime spiritus, exiabea immundissime spiritus, reconosce sententiam tuum diabole, vare statana, vare, you know? Uh, so these things, you know, is it, you know and, and, they, and the new rite of baptism kind of got rid of those exorcisms. I think it was a big mistake. Were you an exorcist? Um, I can neither affirm nor deny. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, we'll just leave it at that, Stephanie, all right? Um, but I, I, I would just say that in the, bap the old baptismal rite, these were the prayers that were said. Now, we do have an exorcism in the new rite, but it's very mild. I don't know if the demons know they're even being talked to. You know, you know, see when the demons hanging around saying, what, is he talking to us? What? what? What's he asking us to do? You know, it's very, it's a very mild mannered exorcism, <laughs> but the old ones were powerful. Now it, it, it was criticized because it sounds, it sounds like you're treating the kid like the kid possessed. Uh, and, and, and in a way, you know, no, no, it's not a major exorcism. It's a minor exorcism, but you are saying, look, any of you demons that have taken up an assignment to think that you can have any role in this person's life, this young child, or this adult who's being baptized, you can consider yourself dismissed. You're out of here because Jesus is coming and this person's about to become a temple of the Holy Spirit. So, out! And, uh, and so, the, there, there is this, if you will, this, this removing of the chains and, and dismissing of the guards and, you know, they're put to sleep or sent away. And now, now the angel goes. Now, here we go. And the angel says here, um, it says here, uh, he struck Peter on the side and woke him, uh, you know, and said, get up quickly. All right. 
he struck Peter on the side and woke him. Hmm. Hmm. So any idea struck him in the side and woke him? Is that just, I'm seeing if any of you got your gears turning. All right, well, let me... Uh, Jesus was I don't mean, inside, no? Okay, somebody just says that, Jose, yeah. I, I think, um, uh, this is Joy, I need to go, like, inside. There's actually light, but um, mm -hmm. maybe struck him on his side. This is Adam and Eve, right? Yeah. Adam and Eve, right. and that's what I think. Okay, so you're both, you're both right on, on the right track here. Here you have... And being struck on the side like Jesus was struck in the side. Now, where where did uh, where did Adam's bride come from out of his wounded side, right? And where does Jesus' bride come from out of his wounded side? You know, but also there came forth from Jesus' side blood and water, blood and water. See, uh, so that again, if we're going to use Peter as a kind of a paradigm for the Christian coming out of bondage and into freedom, out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light then we see that this being, him being struck on the side is a reminder that Christ was struck on the side to make now freedom available for him through the precious blood that he shed and likewise the water of baptism. So we, are, um, we saw that blood and water came forth from Jesus' side. So in a way, there's a reminder here that Christ was struck in his side. And um, I, I often like to, to, to explain holy water to people this way. When you, when you receive holy water that's been blessed, it is now linked to that, so that water that came forth from the side of Christ, okay? It's, it's part of that water that came forth from his side. It's not just been sort of, shazam, blessed, but it's, it links it directly to, to the water that flowed from the side of Christ to cleanse us. All the sacraments have their origin in the, the wounded, the, the, the side of Christ, where the blood and the water came forth, and um, the, the whole sacrifice of the mass, everything's tied in to this moment, okay? So I don't want to overdevelop all this because it's getting a little bit late, but I just want you to, to see that uh, uh, we're trying to look at this as a picture of the human person who is in bondage, but is set free, who's in the kingdom of darkness and bound in chains, who's transferred to the kingdom of light. Okay. Now, it says here, uh, get up quickly. Okay. In other words, arise. Arise. I wish I had my Greek text, but um, I'm almost going to bet you that it's an anastasis, right? A, a, a rise, a, a resurrection, get up, you know, to, to rise and to rise from the dead, you see? So again, using Peter as an image here, struck in the side, get up quickly, arise quickly. Um, all right. So we see this and then, and the chains fell off of his hands. That's baptism. See, he, he's gone from shackles and bondage to freedom. Okay. Just like the Jewish people went through the waters of the Red Sea. On the one side, they were in shackles and enslaved. On the other side, they're free children of God. Okay? Freedom. See? All right. Now, it says here, the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. Now, what's the first thing that an adult does who's baptized? They put on a long, a long white robe. Even in an infant baptism, we say to the infant, see in this, outward gar this white garment you wear the outward sign of your Christian dignity. With your parents and godparents to help you bring this dignity unstained to the great judgment seat of Christ. Okay, so we have here then uh, yet another baptismal image here, all right? The, the water, the, stri the striking, and so on. Get up, arise. Okay, now we see here it says here, dress yourself and put on your sandals. Now, the uh, the, the idea here is um, the what is the it, what, the image of the baptismal robe isn't just a robe. It, 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 it says in the book of Revelation that it is given to the bride of Christ, namely the church, to be dressed in a long white robe. And the, and the robe is the righteousness of the saints. So in other words, the robe represents us being clothed in the righteousness of God. Hmm? There is, uh, remember a parable that Jesus told about a wedding feast and all the people are in there, but one man isn't wearing the wedding garment. And he says, why, isn't, why aren't you wearing a wedding garment? He wouldn't say why. And so he's thrown out. Because the garment is a, is a symbol of the righteousness that's required to be at the great wedding feast of the Lamb, okay? So you see these, these images of robes and sandals and so on. Now, sandals here, uh, there's not a whole lot to say about them, except that, you know, you put on your sandals so that you can begin to make a pilgrimage, to walk somewhere. You're putting your shoes on because you're going somewhere, see? You're getting out of this jail. 
and you're going toward the kingdom of God, out, out of this dark dungeon and into the light. See, that's where you're going. Okay. Now, it goes on to say here, uh, he did so. He says, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Okay. So uh, that's that kind of an outer garment, you know, like a jacket or, a, I mean, it was a longer garment. Okay. So I, I can't develop all these things with you, but, you know, we need special protections to live in this world, don't we? Right. So uh, now follow me. Now notice that word, follow me. Now the angel here actually represents Christ, right? It's not, it's not Christ, but at, in the book of Revelation, Christ is, is, is sometimes represented as an angel, right? Um, so, he, um, uh, but follow me. Now you see, <clears throat> suck him in the side, get up, arise from the dead, O sleeper, uh, and uh, you know, put on the robe of righteousness, put on your sandals, and start following me, says the Lord, okay? Now we see that... Um, um, goes on to say, um, uh, let's see, dress yourself. And he, as he did, it's his record cloak, okay. And then he went out and he followed him. He didn't know, he didn't understand that this whole thing was real. He thought he was dreaming. Now, but I, I, what I tried to do with you there is to see, this is something that you call Lexio Divina that we've been doing. You just take a look at a, a certain section of the text. And you say, wow, what does this remind me of? Hmm, what's going on here? Because it's not just something that happened to Peter in some jail 2000 some years ago. This is also what happens to you and me when we're baptized. This is our story. It's not just Peter's something that happened to him a long time ago. Okay. And so I don't have time to develop a lot of the other stuff, but we know that again, it says, uh, uh, well, there's one little detail I'd like to point out. Um, verse nine he says, he went out and he followed the angel. He didn't know what was being done, but it was by the, he thought he was seeing a vision. Now it says that, number verse 10, when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to an iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went out along the street. And immediately the angel left him. Now, um, you might just see here, if you want to just continue this idea of the pilgrimage being let out of the jail, they go past one guard and they go past a second guard. You and I, in our journey, we do encounter dangers. We encounter people that things or people or situations that can bring us back into bondage if we, if we bother with them. But they, they, they're asleep and, and just keep walking right past them. See, don't involve yourself with these kinds of things, right? And then likewise, they finally come down a long, narrow passage, and this iron gate opens of its own accord, almost as if to say, you know, the kingdom of heaven now is available to you. Uh, and Peter goes out free, free, and the angel leaves him. He's now been set free. So one day, we pray too, the gates of heaven will be open for us, and we will be totally free. Then, you see, right now we're trying to lose the shackles and avoid the guards and <laughs> some of the other pitfalls, okay? So, okay, now do you, see, do you see what I was trying to do with you there? Okay, you, you take, you take a, a story, but you're, scripture is not spectator sport, or at least it shouldn't be. It's, it's your story, it's my story. So if you're prepared to accept that you're Peter, or you're, you know, you're whoever else might be in a story. Uh, you, you know, you, you, maybe you've been the angel that helped to lead some people out of bondage and help people and get them to baptism. Um, uh, and again, you know, like, like focus does, you know, trying to reach people, um, especially in vulnerable settings like colleges, which are a lot of them, as you know, are moral cesspools, you know, college life can be very challenging and <laughs> very, uh, put people in real bondage, you know, and, um, so you see the idea, you're, you're the angel, you're Peter, see? Uh, and you're Rhoda, who, uh, you're the church praying, I'm the church praying, and sometimes the church unbelieving. Oh, I can't really be Peter, he's all locked up. Well, you, you must be crazy. He, when, when Rhoda comes and says, he's at the gate, he's at the gate, he's here. Um, and there's, oh no, I can't be so, he's, he's locked up. So sometimes even the church is praying, even sometimes even when she's not very believing, but God still hears those prayers and God chooses whom he'll deliver. So even our most distracted or fearful prayers, God still can hear them and use them, okay? So those are just some of the other details I would say here, okay? Um, let's, can we just, uh, any quick comments or questions? Because we'll just finish this chapter out uh, with the death of Herod, which is um, good news, but we don't need to spend a lot of time on it. But any quick other questions about this? Okay, all right. Well, go ahead then, Stephanie, just finish us out there. Um, okay. He has long been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, who now came to him in a body. After winning over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they sued for peace because their country was supplied with food
from the king's territory. On an appointed day, Herod, attired in royal robes and seated on the rostrum, addressed them publicly. The assembled crowd cried out, this is the voice of a God, not of a man. At once the angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not ascribe the honor to God and he went he was eaten by worms and breathed his last, but the word of God continued to spread and grow. Mm -hmm. After Barnabas and Saul completed their relief mission, they returned to Jerusalem, taking with um, John, who is called Mark. Okay, and that's going to set us up for the first missionary journey. Now, this terrible story about Herod Antipas, right? You know, he allowed himself to uh, be kind of treated like a god, and, and God said, well, that's enough of that, and struck him. And, it, you know, this idea of worms, you know, <laughs> they're, they're frequently in the, in the ancient world, um, you know, uh, there were some pretty bad stomach ailments, y'all. <laughs> For example, uh, Athanasius chuckled when Arius, uh, the great heretic of the fourth century, uh, I mean, uh, the third century died, and they said that uh, he was compelled, he was compelled by nature to withdraw to a privy where he fell headlong and his bowels burst asunder and worms came forth. <laughs> and Athanasius is chuckling as he tells the story of the end of, uh, of Arius. And we see this kind of a similar thing here, uh, that uh, God allows a natural thing, basically his, his, his bowels just burst and he's, uh, he's struck dead right there, just as he's enjoying being called a god. Uh, so Herod had a pretty bad end, and uh, Herod deserved a pretty bad end, okay? He, Is that what you have said, that his bowels burst? Uh, it says here, uh, the voice got, immediately the angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. So I'm guessing that the idea of these worms being so suddenly present um, were that he already had a stomach ailment going on. It, it was not uncommon uh, in the ancient world for people to have lots of tapeworms and other things going on down there that... Most of us can hardly imagine today, you know. Dr. Ben will tell us, man, medicine is great. <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, I just, uh, I, 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 these are tough times we're living through, but I'm, I'm awful glad that I have running water and it's pure and clean and, <laughs> but all I, all I can say is that, um, um, yeah, there were some pretty awful things uh, that could get you in the, in the ancient world before modern medicine, okay. All right, so here's at his end. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but just we do see that now it says that Barnabas and Saul return from Jerusalem. They come back up to Antioch and they brought with them a guy named John Mark. And these three are going to be the three main ones who go out on the first missionary journey. And now we've pretty much closed the Acts of Peter and we're going to open up now with the Acts of Paul. So that's where we'll end tonight and where we'll pick up next time, next, uh, next Monday. Okay, now, by the way, I think, uh, yeah, next Monday is the if so it's not the holiday, right? It's actually the sixth. So we're, we're okay with me on Monday? Okay, good. All right, now with all that in mind, uh, any quick final questions? I know I want to ask Joy, I want you to ask you to sit, tell us something, but... Um, John Mark, is that his name? Both names or is it... Yeah, yeah, it would be, but it was just, uh, this is John Mark, but he, he later just became known as Mark. He became the secretary of Peter and would be the one who wrote the gospel of Mark. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Now, Joy, you were going to have a, we're going to try a little something here on Thursday. You want to just talk about um, it? Yes. So actually, oh, actually um, oh gosh, this is weird. I have headphones on and I can hear myself talk. I'm going to fix uh, the sound really quickly on my end. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can you guys okay. hear me? Yeah. Um, oh, so um, I think actually, actually talking with some of the staff at um, Holy Comforter, uh, we are probably going to end up pushing it back, but oh. that is right. Yeah, um, uh, because uh, they just, logistically speaking, uh, I think um, uh, Gershon thought it'd be a good idea for me to talk with Kim first. Um, so there's a little bit of background of that, but coming soon, um, I'm going to send an email uh, to correct that. But coming soon, we are going to be doing um, a video viewing of The Chosen, which is uh, a really good uh, series, kind of like a mini series um, that uh, 
podcast recently come out and it's about the life of Jesus. Um, so I've seen it. It's eight episodes. It's really well done. It's really beautiful. Um, but the idea is what we're going to do once it gets kind of the final approval of, of the staff, um, we're going to uh, just basically uh, get a projector and sit outside Holy Comforter um, and in the evening um, and just like have everyone kind of bring a blanket or a beach towel or something and sit outside and watch um, one or two episodes of The Chosen and have speakers. Um, so that'll actually now probably happen in like two weeks instead of on Thursday. Um, but oh. I just spoke with Gershon like right before Bible study. So um, we're going to, yeah, just we're going to do that. So not as soon as I want it, but, um, okay. but yeah, but I will correct okay. that in a bit. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. good. We'll get more information from you. And uh, Joy, if you don't mind, um, after we end the class here, could you uh, e email me uh, if I don't already have it? Would there, would there be a number I could give you a quick call and ask you something about this? Yes. Please. I will email it to you right after that, right after okay. Friday. Good. Thank you. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, everybody. Good. I think it, um, um, yeah. So we've kind of turned a corner here in the, in the Acts of the Apostles, and we're going to be changing our focus, but it, uh, the church is stepping up and stepping out, and we're starting to see the mission to the Gentiles open up, and Peter and Paul, I mean, uh, well, this is their great feast day, so... Uh, it's kind of that perfect day for us to sort of do the handshake where we move from the acts of Peter to the acts of Paul. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we bless you. We thank you and we ask your mercy uh, upon us that we might uh, in every way um, celebrate this great feast day of Peter and Paul and rejoice that um, these two men, very different yet, uh, both of them great leaders of the church. Um, and um, we ask that uh, we'll always honor their, their martyrdom what they suffered so that we can have the faith. And uh, now as we end the, Peter, the Acts of Peter and open up the Acts of Paul, we'll certainly hear from Peter again, but uh, we, uh, we turn our attention now to Paul and we ask your mercy um, as we follow him on his many journeys through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. Um, may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. All right. You all look marvelous. <laughs> We'll see you next time. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you, Monsignor. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.